Hey, Craving Thank Consciousness you. podcast. You guys, I'm so excited to bring Liz, a child, holistic trauma coach to the podcast. Um, so thank you for it, agreeing to jump on here with me. Of course. Yes. So I told her we were just going to riff off because that's how we roll on this podcast. There's nothing professional about it, right? We just, we just start talking and that's what real life is really about. So I am so excited you, you agreed to come on here, Liz, because I was just recording another episode a few days ago, or rather I'm kind of coming back right from my hiatus. And, and I was talking about trauma. And then in that podcast, I was like, well, I had a trauma coach and that's where, and I first started discovering that I actually had something. So I wanted you to come on here and share about our experience together and what you've been up to since then, since we've worked together. Um, I really enjoyed working with you because you had names to things that was going on. Um, and part of the last podcast that I did, I talked about the reason why I took this massive hiatus off after my husband died, which is 20 weeks exactly today, mm -hmm. um, was because of what I uncovered with you after two, two years after my mother died. That's when I was like, I have to do something. And so after working with you, I knew, you know what, I'm going to have to completely take time off. 100%. I mean, that's, that's the thing about, about grief. Grief is not linear. I know like, you know, the, you know, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross talk, you know, is like, talks about the five stages of grief. And it's like, it would be lovely if we would actually just pass through each one. It's just like, you know, oh, okay, great. Already been through that. And like now on to the next one. And then I can be done with this process. And then I can just, you know, more forward with my life. And, you know, guess what? Life doesn't work that way. And it's not linear. Time is actually not even linear. It's just a construct. And it's all about our relationship to it, which is why some things can feel like they last for other, forever. And then some things feel like, you know, can last like so many seconds. It's all in, it's all in relationship and life is 100% subjective. So when we have trauma, there's, trauma doesn't actually exist in, in like time doesn't exist in the traumatic mind. So what's really fascinating about that is when you said, it's like you had names to things. There's a lot of power in acknowledgement to name a thing means you now have dominion over it. To, to acknowledge it means that now we are making the subconscious conscious and therefore we now have the ability to change it. When we experience trauma for whatever trauma or for whatever reason it is, is it blinds us to the possibilities of how we can grow and heal from it despite how painful it may be at the time. Yeah. And I noticed for, for me, and I'm sure for a lot of other people, it's, it's like, you don't even realize that your brain has just turned into trauma brain and is running with some thing because you, your, your brain is like, Oh, stay away from pain. Right. Yep. Stay away from pain. So I noticed when my husband died, the first thing I wanted to do is just move out, the, just move out the country. Just let's just get rid of this life completely. Whoa. And let's just go over here where that pain isn't. And I remember one of my friends saying, are you sure you're not trying to come up with a new life just to avoid this one? And I thought, yep. oh shit, you know, <laughs> you're just like run, run from the pain. And there's just different people have different behaviors, I guess, around it. But that was me. I was ready just to jump ship and to find a whole new life and just pretend like this one didn't happen. So I wouldn't be in pain. You know, it's, it's funny how the mind works that way. It's like, we can just go, oh, okay, you know, out of, out of sight, out of mind. And then we just go, we want to, we want to run. We want to suppress it. We want to deny it. We want to like withdraw from it. We want to project it onto other people. We want to feel anything but actually grieving because we're like, most of the time our mind will tell us, but if I feel this, I'll always feel this way. And if I feel this, it will break me. And if I feel this, then it makes it true. So a lot of times when we want to provide ourselves with a distraction and that can cross very easily over into addiction or when we simply don't want to do something we just go like you'll just go oh cool i'll just move to a whole another country and it's like but no matter where you go there you are there is no denying or escaping you 
I got goosebumps for that one. No matter where you go. There you are. There you are. Damn. Isn't that the case? Because I, you know, it's only been 20 weeks. I make it sound like, oh, <laughs> it's been a whole 20 weeks. But uh, I still have these little thoughts like, well, if I, like you said, addiction, right? If I had this thing, then I probably wouldn't hurt so bad. If I, if I did this thing, I probably wouldn't hurt so bad. It's true. We think there's thoughts, but in reality, the only way out is through, is to actually feel it, to be able to heal it. It's the only thing that actually works because we actually end up passing on what we don't process. So we end up perpetuating our hurt and pain. And that's how things become and turn into complicated grief. And then it becomes much harder because then it becomes hardwired into the subconscious. And what's really crazy about that, and I know you know this, is the mind will actually return each night when we go into the REM sleep, the rapid eye movement to regenerate. And our mind will return to those subconscious blocked memories to process. If we do not process it, our mind will keep going back to that scenario until we complete the action of what we needed to say or do or feel until it becomes resolved. And we recreate those scenarios and situations in our life. And that's how, when we come up against something, perhaps another feeling of loss or fear of if I love someone that I could lose them too, or what happens if my own health declines or what kind of legacy am I leaving? All of these are existentialist questions. Jeez. And we're all here for that purpose, to answer those questions, to really figure out who we are and to disseminate that knowledge and energy. And it's, and it's a process. The entire, entire life is process. And, like, and death is actually something that's extraordinarily needed because it releases us from this bondage of fear. And then we move on to another level, another stage of life. And then that energy just simply gets transmuted into something else. But we don't ever want to think that and we don't prepare for it. But that's why we always say that life is now. This is all you have. Nothing is ever guaranteed. We want that security. We don't know what's actually beyond the veil, but like, but we get snippets of it. We get thoughts of it. And then, then really we come to the question of, so what am I really doing here? Who am I really choosing to be? Who am I choosing to love and allow into my life? And then, you know, am I going to be able to, to remember them? Like, am I able to remember who I am with them? And there is a beauty and a grace in that. That's like, because if we didn't have fear of death, of dying, of pain, we would never improve. We would never progress. We would simply cease to exist. There would be no point. So it's like, this is where it's like, death is simply another turn of the wheel. And then we get to look at our own responsibility. How are we showing up in this moment? Because like yeah. your, your husband's always going to be a part of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's wild that <clears throat> you're saying all that because one of the things I said after he left was I'm out of all the things that we ever grew through experienced in our 21 years together, we were always together. And so mm -hmm. I, I had wrote a post saying, I've got to figure out who I, who am I without you? And now I'm starting to see that person, right? But like you said, and if you now bring in a new partnership, then you have to be like, well, you know, I still have to be my identity. <clears throat> and that's kind of what I talked about on the, the other podcast of talking about going down to the underworld mm. and literally taking off every piece of your identity and trying to find it. And then, you know, because we worked together for quite a while, with my, my mother trauma, right. And how you were saying just a minute ago, how it's going to keep coming up, coming up until it's resolved. And just finally, now I'm finally not just now starting to parent myself better because now not only do I not have mom, I don't, I don't have a husband where I was bouncing things off the wall with him. Right. Right. And so would you say that one of the biggest things for people with grief is to like learn to trust themselves or parent themselves. That is actually one of the biggest assignments and lessons that we come into this life to learn 
is that who are we in relationship to others? And sexual neuroscientists refer to as co-regulation. So it's like, yes, well, there's part of it that we get to know ourselves, but then we know ourselves more in relationship of how we're showing up to other people and they mirror that back to us. And then we end up adjusting our behavior and our beliefs of how we're showing up in accordance to that. It's like, so when like we strip away some of that and like later in life, like we give to ourselves the things that our parents couldn't or wouldn't because it's like, what happened to you? The trauma that happened to you is never your fault. It's not, not that it's not as if we'd ever ask for that, but it will always be your responsibility to heal from it, to learn what it had to teach you. Death and fear are the powerful teachers. And life is a hard teacher. It gives you the test first and the lesson later. So you get to choose, how do you wanna to relate to it? What do you wanna learn? And then what are you passing on? So yes, those lessons, it's always going to be our responsibility to go, so who am I when I look past what my parents taught me? When I look past what society, my culture, my socioeconomic class, my traumas taught me, who do I wanna be? And then I can shift and mold myself into that. And then as we go into any relationship, we don't get to lose that which we fought so hard to become. Because women especially have such a tendency to define their, the quality of their relationships is accordance to correlation to their self-worth. And that's actually backward. You know, no, you're a goddess in and of your own right. And it's not up to anyone else to tell you who to be and that you have to earn love. Yeah. It, is, it is inherent and it is within you. Own it. Amen to that. I think one of the reasons why my husband and I, Phil, my second husband, because he was my second husband, and it makes me laugh that I could that I say that I've had two. <laughs> it just sounds weird in my head, but um, what was I going to say? It got well, but think about head. this. Think about this. At one point, it also felt weird to actually refer to yourself as a wife. True. Or to refer to yourself as an entrepreneur or a, a, a wealthy woman. Yeah, because like, it's like we get to try it on. Try it on. And, you know, and sometimes, sometimes we don't like it or it wasn't something that we, you know, we wanted and then we get to change it. So in shifting our identity, it feels extremely risky. It feels very raw. And especially with trauma, if we've actually become that trauma or we've defined our personality and our identity based on that to change that to something that is unknown and then to actually go out into the world to proclaim that feels really awkward and very weird. I think but that's why necessary. some people get stuck in the grief because 100%. I've seen a couple of my followers, you know, especially since I've been talking about what's going on in my life, reached out, reaching out. And, and I, you know, I feel empathy for them because mm -hmm. they're still, where they were in that grief years and years later. And like you said, it's not linear, but I feel like they, they started owning that I, as their identity. I feel like this is it. Well, and there's a reason why a lot of people will get stuck in that is because, and we've seen this with like, with, with PTSD in veterans, that if they come back, and then to grieve the loss of a comrade that they were so incredibly close to, what it means for a lot of times for them and what gets them stuck in the grief and in the trauma is they feel that if they actually let go and allowed themselves to live and have an identity and to find pleasure in life, that is somehow that they are forgetting them or dishonoring them in some way. And that's a lot of times it's, it's not the case. We still get to honor and we still get to grieve them but to be able to move past survivor's guilt, to be able to move past, but who am I without them? And if like, if I begin to move forward, am I forgetting them? Did I really love them? You know, is the suffering, is, is that not what I'm supposed to do? And so that's why I always recommend that someone really find a professional that can go through the, those stages and that reclamation and that healing with them. And see, so here's the thing is we don't, we don't move on. We don't forget. We get to move forward. And it's not about fixing it because there is no fix for that. It is a, it's permanent. 
we get to move forward and learn how to live with that hole in our heart and what they had to teach us and then honoring their place in our lives because the human spirit does not want to be fixed. It wants to be witnessed. We want someone to witness us in our pain and then still hold a place for us and love us as we are and as we, as we choose to become. That's power. And that's so often so many times that we're afraid to face our own light. Yeah. I think for, for me, at least based on my background of being a medium and, you know, communicating with, and, and like seeing that big picture, I really think that helped me because otherwise I, I would be like some of my clients, like immediately looking for that medium to have some sort of proof that that person really is moved on, that that person's still watching you, sending you signs, you know? So I think for me, I, I knew it was a lesson. I, I mean, I knew it. I was, I ain't gonna lie, I was pissed off. You know? And amen. And like in anger, you know, which you know this with your work with me, anger is always a lid. It's always a lid for other emotions. So it's like when we become angry, we want to feel powerful. We want to feel anything other than the sadness. And then it's like, sometimes it's to feel powerless. It is so incredibly uncomfortable. Like, you know, screw you. How could you leave me? How could you die? How could I be so in love with someone that I'm going to miss them so much? It's like, I feel like my soul has been ripped from my body, set on fire and then tossed on the ground and you're stomping on it. It's like, yes. And this is also the risk, the inherent risk we have with love. It's the cost. Yeah. Damn it. <laughs> I know I mean, it's, it's one it's one of those fuck my life moments yes absolutely and it's again it's but where I would say it's like you know I always hated that saying it's like it's better to have loved and lost I mean it's actually by a poet but it's like you know I kind of I kind of love the line in uh, men in black when he was like well it's better to have loved and lost and the guy goes yeah oh yeah try it yeah and it's like so that there is no there is no balm for that there is no salve there is no it's like and we begin to to heal and reconstruct and to move forward but we never forget yeah so and so you know and talking about relationship dynamics too i feel like it is so important for you to know who you are your identity before you enter into a relationship that's what i was going to say earlier is that, amen is that's why i feel like i had such a healthy relationship with Phil, because from the very beginning, it was like, no, are you uncomfortable? Then you could go home. Right. Like I had ball boundary balls from the get go. And that's why our relationship was like that. Cause we, well, you already we know were. me. I, I always tell men that it's like, you know, my balls are bigger. I just wear them on my chest. <laughs> I love it. So it's like, you know, I'm, I'm like, I actually refer to this as a cover charge. It's like, there is a cover charge of what it takes to be in a relationship with me. It's like, do you believe in me? Do you trust me? Are you willing to grow with me, spend time with me? And it's like, you know, I'm not someone's downtime, sometime, meantime, anytime, or just when you have some time, you know, I am, as one of my friends have put it, a force of nature. <laughs> and it's like, when it comes to that, it's like, Yes. And it's like anyone who is not willing to go there with me and doesn't have that level of emotional intelligence, it's like, I don't have time for this. And I'm not going to sit here and explain it to you. It's like, I can love you and I can also let you go. It's okay. Because there are many people who are not willing to take their ego on. There are many people who are not willing to move past a painful anything because they're afraid of what that might mean for them. And it's like, so, but the ego the ego demands, demands to be met. And it's like, it's also to keep us safe, you know, but there's no, there's no growth in the comfort zone. There's no, no growth in safety. And we don't have that naturally in nature anyway. So it's like what we create, like ourselves, like you, know, so you came in this world alone, you're going to go out alone. doesn't mean we can't be connected. It doesn't mean we don't get to have our experiences, but you always get to have your own back. Amen. And I so feel like that's that. such an important message. For, I, you know, I really feel like you said, you said, this is like the reason why we're here is to figure this shit out, to trust your damn self, you know, mm -hmm. and not, and this goes into people pleasing so much, right? Oh, don't get me started. That's a trauma response. Is it really? 
people pleasing of course it is oh because like because when our family of origin if our parents didn't like something it's like our entire survival depended upon them well and it's like even our even our ego survival depended on being accepted having validation having you know like having that love and so it's like what happens when that pattern gets carried over into adulthood and we people please because oh well I can't have somebody be mad at me oh but you know I see his potential I'm in love with him still oh red flag honey (laughs) right I swear I had to see red flags like a mile million miles away a couple of my girlfriends do you see my dilemma oh my daughter dilemma in dating oh oh, girl I don't even know what's gonna happen (laughs) you know, put my little feelers out there. I don't, a girl, <laughs> I don't even know. Well, yeah, I, you know what? And that's kind of where I've, I've really come to surrender and being in my feminine and, you know, and like, there's a level of like, how do I put this reception? Because I mean, like I used to be, I used to be very stuck in my masculine of going out and like, I got to find the man, I got to get the man, he's got to be fixed and I got to fix him and like you know, all the things, all the things. And like, he's got to have this and this and this and this and this and this. And it's like, you know, like, no, it's like, here's like one of the things that I love about the law of attraction in every context is we don't, we don't actually attract what we want. Like I can want what I want till here in kingdom comes. Like I attract who I'm being. Yes. So if I'm being powerful and being the queen that I am, well, it's like, that's what attracts a king. And it's like, it's not about, you already know how my, my philosophy on this is like, I'm much more interested in what's between a man's ears than his legs or in his bank account. It's like, so for me, I'm like, he needs to be emotionally intelligent, which means that he's actually not only willing to acknowledge his feelings, but is willing to join me in that. And then being willing to have creative problem solving. He knows himself. He has his own interests, his own family, his own like ambition. And then it's like, but then we come together, we talk about those things and we, we move together. It's like, no, I'm, I'm in this for like the long haul. And it's also to know that the inherent risk of that is that that person can choose out at any given time or that they can die. We still don't have a guarantee, but is it worth time and the commitment and the energy and the investment ultimately yes it can be but that's not based on who you think you have to become or pleasing them because that's inauthentic and like when we're inauthentic what do we attract oh a shit show is what we attract oh, right? the reflection of that <clears throat> the universe says Always. as you wish as you freaking wish mm-hmm so important to be, have the the boundary balls when you first get in a relationship, know who you are. Don't friggin' Oh my heck. See a red flag and forget it. No, (laughs) no wait, Like, and that's what I would say, what I would tell most of your listeners, if ever you're listening to this is like, when somebody shows you who they really are the first time, believe them. Amen. Like, I, I'm like, you know what? My friends started calling me Neo. (laughs) Like, cause how many bullets I've dodged a good Lord. (laughs) So it's like, yes. And like, and sometimes I can be, I can be completely like, especially like with dating, you know, what I've actually done at this point is like, I date for growth. I don't date to find the one because like, I have many, many different soul mates and soul family out there. And it's like, there's lots of people that are going to resonate with me or they're going to really like me. And then there's going to be people who are going to detest me. It's like, it's like everything is about you and nothing is about you. It's never personal. It's like the four agreements, right? So it's, but like, well, but I always get to be integrous for me and like being that authentic and like actually loving myself and then being able to have healthy boundaries. That is the ultimate self-care. Hey, yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Wow. Wow. So I did want to ask you, because before we started recording, we were talking about how you've branched out and you're talking about nutrition and your brain. Let's talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. No, holistic means mind, body, and energy, which can be translated also to spiritual. So with the mind, that is actually what I got started with as being a certified trauma therapist hell just being an lcpc in my state which is the state that's why like a lot of times i'll tell people i don't 
I cannot give therapy to someone outside of this state or any state that I'm licensed in or somewhere else in the world. But with coaching, I can. And so the mind and the mindset is like therapy will always be my first love. And I love it, but talking can only get you so far because in trauma, the language centers of the mind shut down. We've seen this over and over again in like brain scans. Like we get stuck in silent horror and like all of the feelings because emotions are designed to last anywhere from 60 to 120 seconds. But what we tell ourselves about the emotion is described as a feeling. So emotions are meant to be experienced in the mind, but feeling is what is meant to be experienced in the body. So a lot of times with the body, we go, I don't, I don't want to feel this. Like this is one of the reasons why anxiety and depression are extraordinarily prevalent and huge, honestly, a health crisis in the United States. And then doctors are just simply throwing medications and pills at it. So 80 to 95% of mental illnesses can actually be drastically reduced, if not eliminated with the proper diet, supplements, and exercise, but they don't teach you that. So the more that I've been learning about hormone balance and regulation and about gut health and about the different supplements that actually support your mental health, and what happens is with, with depression, with anxiety, and even with trauma, it creates an internal inflamed state throughout your entire body. It's like literally your mind is like an electrical kind of fire. And the mind can't actually sustain that for very long. And that's when like, you know, there's so many people who get stuck in like immunological disorders, lupus, like pain disorders, like fibromyalgia. We see this with people who have had, you know, childhood sexual abuse. And it's like where the nerve endings are on fire and that's what causes the pain. It creates a feedback loop. And so we feel bad and we get constantly fatigued. And yet most of the things that are in our culture, all of the processed foods and like the, the, like the things that are irradiated, have GMOs, we're taking like antibiotics, like there's no tomorrow, like our immune system is compromised. And so like trauma gets stuck in the body. Yeah. And therefore, like, so we're not, we're not clearing it. And like, we don't have a mind body connection that simply is just severed. So it gets perpetuated. Yeah. And so it's like, that's where everything needs to be actually moved through and expressed. And that gets done and like on all three levels, otherwise it's incomplete and it won't work. Yeah. I've been learning a lot about nutrition and the body and how it responds and the blood, mm -hmm. because just like you said, what was Brandeline's trauma response? Oh my God, am I going to die? <laughs> because my husband died. So immediately I'm like, Oh my God, I'm going to die. You know, like that trauma. Well, but get, well, I, I mean, and you know what? It's actually a completely normal reaction. Yeah. So, but I learned, I've been learning a lot and because I'm into the spiritual awakening realm, right? Listen to this and tell me if this doesn't sound like Mal like malnutrition perhaps. Right. So my husband was, you know, he was getting sick. He was sick the last couple months of his life. And we had taken a trip to Michigan and he was just not feeling good. He was not doing good. And he kept having horrible nightmares of like ghosts in our hotel rooms. Like, mm. and he, to the point where he said that something was holding him down, um, just really traumatic. Right. And I'm doing all things, cleansing this and that Well, fast forward to now. And I was reading somebody's post that is it really into health and really understands how the body works. And they were saying that sometimes they snap into like this lower vibrational state and they, they think thoughts that aren't, aren't right. Right. That, that are very negative. Um, mm -hmm. and so I was saying, don't you think that's kind of related to, you know, spiritual, awakening, but we both came to this kind of agreement or this aha, where it was like, your vibration's so low and you're so loaded with heavy metals and, and you're, and you're obviously he was sick. Well, so then you're starting to have like, I don't know if they're hallucinations, but you're starting to have that experience because that is the vibration that you're, you're in. That's the mm -hmm. dimension, if you will, that you're experiencing. Yeah. So the Very dirty possible. blood, the toxic blood, 
you know, the low vibration. Well, yeah, and that's, that's the inflammation in the body. So it's like, because when we have emotions and we have that pain, what happens is the amygdala gets turned on. That's our fear center. Oh, okay. And so in that, it sends a signal to the rest of the body and it, it prepares for a trauma response, which is fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And the adrenals that actually there's little walnut organs that sit on top of the kidneys begin to release adrenaline and cortisol. So, and now in most cases, like there is no bear. This is why we actually get like, you know, lots of stress and that's like long-term sustained stress. It's like, well, I have a deadline. This has to be due by such and such, or I'm going to a party and I'm afraid I'm going to be rejected. It's like all of those, the mind doesn't understand the difference between fear and anxiety. Anxiety is a perception and it's always future-based, but fear is actually present and very real. So the body doesn't understand the difference. So when what happens is, is when those, those chemicals get released into the bloodstream, it goes to the gut. The gut is the second brain. So a lot of it gets metabolized. And so when it, the body can't get rid of it, because it's not being burned off running from the bear, it, what happens is it actually creates micro perforations in the lining of the, of the gut. Really? And so those enzymes that actually become the free radicals that enter into the bloodstream, that's where the inflammation comes and it begins to attack certain parts of the body. This is one of the reasons why insulin resistance is so huge right now. And then we're actually, a lot of times we're eating over it and we're eating processed foods, which can further inflame all of those things. Because again, it's not being re like, rejected from the body it's just simply cortisol is actually the chemical that when it's not burned off like makes like fat stored around the middle and so like that's where we're seeing a lot of this and then like that's where we're seeing so much hormone imbalance this is why like people go on like these diets and they're going but i'm doing everything right you know i've like i've decreased the calories and i you know i'm drinking more water and i'm going to the gym and it's like well because you have leaky gut syndrome and it's like, so if you had a precipitating traumatic event, it's about being able to change your mindset to be able to be on that and like to balance the hormones, repair the gut, which now doesn't cause that inflammation, which can send the signal back to the brain to begin healing. Yeah. And then, then in therapy, it can be processed to change the habits, patterns, oh, and beliefs. I like that. How you painted the picture about the full process. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> It's, yeah, a, it's a cycle like the, 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 like the ecology of the body and it's, it's based and dependent upon your ethnicities, your genetic code, your micro, you know, the, the gut micro, and then also like your neurochemical responses to things. And I think it gets downplayed so much because most doctors, they just, they just, they have, number one, most of the time, like, and there's, you already know this is that there is a, there's a fat phobia and there is weight discrimination and there's diet culture. And it's like, well, we're all supposed to eat the same thing and exercise the same amount. And we're supposed to look all the same. And that's BS. And like the BMI is only one indicator and it's not really an accurate indicator of health. So it's just like, if I were to give you the Beck depression inventory, that's only one inventory of one particular subset of a mental illness, but it does not create context and it doesn't test for anything else. So it's like to take that and to just go, oh, well, you know, this is what you have without doing other conclusive tests or spending time with the person and then actually being invested in looking at what could they change in every context of their life, mind, body, or energy is like, honestly, it's, it's completely unethical and it's, it's not even beneficial. It's honestly just ignorance and laziness. And like our medical system is rife with that because how many people can actually afford the time that it takes to be able to really educate people and then to show them what it is and what it means to actually have self-care. Right. We don't do that. We no. don't actually, we don't even teach emotional intelligence in schools. And we, we just follow, you know, what every, everybody's told us. Right. So I was even talking to my daughter, um, and I remember talking to you, I was doing the keto, right? And Ooh, I'm keto, like, why did... keto is so bad for your hormones for a woman. I know. So I'm like, why did my mom teach me this when now I've learned completely opposite, right? I'm like, oh my God, your liver hates high fat, high protein diet. Like, you know what I mean? I'm like, and then I've learned so much. 
everything goes to back to liver, back to liver, or like you're saying, the leaky gut, leaky gut, the liver. So I, I'm just blown away. And my daughter's like, yeah, well, they used to, <laughs> she found some article where they used to toast bread with asbestos. She's like, well, there you go, mom. Like that, we don't do that anymore, do we? She like literally sent me an image. It was like, put your toast on the asbestos to make it crunchy, like in the fifties or something. I'm like, Oh my heck. So it's, it's really, well, you know what? Well, and like, you know what, like we're like, we, we get to learn more about the human body and like, and not a context of like making money. Um, but it's, you know, like back in like the, uh, in the Edwardian England, they actually used, um, arsenic <laughs> to be able to like, you know, line, line their eyes and <laughs> Like, I can't even I believe like, the stuff we did, right? Well, I mean, not only that, like today, like today, I was like, I was watching a, uh, a TikTok and there was a man who was actually describing up until the 1970s, like the last one was like the, the you know, the Supreme Court had actually passed a law that Hitler actually like highlighted in his Mein Kampf that he was praising the United States Supreme Court for the eugenics that was performed on women to involuntarily sterilize them if their genetics were not seen to be par. And oh it was like, heck. so the they 70s? actually, yeah, all the way up to the seventies, it was like, this actually happened. And it's like, so there is documented evidence that eugenics actually started with us prior to World War II that we like, they had actually, they actually ended up sterilizing over 178,000 women against their will. Many of them did not, never knew what it was actually done to them. Yeah. So it goes to show you, you got to educate yourself about your body and your own system. Yes. And advocate for yourself. And, and it's like, and it's never, ever about looks. And it's like, so, you know, and like you talked about heavy metals earlier and it's like, the amount of toxins in our homes, in our, in our, up against our skin and in our what, it is insane. We are killing ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, we are. So honestly, I think the obesity epidemic, and I put that in air quotes is because like, it's complete BS. It's like, we have much, much more prevalent things to be worrying about. Yeah. Yeah. So no, I love how you painted the picture of the the mind, body, soul. And the more I go into the spiritual awakening and quantum physics it, it and how your brain works and the neural pathways and how it's responding to all the chemicals in your body. And, mm. you know, and like you said, the hormones, wow, you can be, you know, you do a little detox and mm -hmm. your brain opens up and you could think better and you didn't know you weren't thinking right. And yeah. And your body yeah, like starts shrinking because it's not carrying around toxic and you weren't even trying to diet. You know what right? I mean? Yeah, I know because you haven't you haven't seen me in quite some time, like at least not on a, like a Zoom call. But like, you know, like I'm sure you can probably see. Like, can you see it in my face how much mm -hmm. weight I've lost? Yeah, same. And it's like I wasn't, wasn't even trying. I'm like I have not even weighed myself. Like I don't even care about that. It's much more about how I feel and then what I'm what I'm committed to creating in my own life. And it's like, and then, you know, I really don't give a damn how it looks to anybody else yeah. because I feel better. And like, for example. I've like, I'm on a modified paleo diet just purely because I realized that on a spiritual and physical level, gluten rips yeah. me up. It just, it just kills me. And as much as I'm like, I love it. Like my, my mind loves it. And like my, but it's like, my God, the brain fog, like my joints hurt, the gas, the bloating, horrible. I, and then it's it like, changes I just, my eyesight. If I have gluten, I can immediately go up. Oh. I can't see as good as I did before I ate it. It's like goes into cloudy or something. Right. And then like the forgetfulness and like, it, no, it's, it's crazy. And like almost all of it is GMOs because I'm, I was in, when I spent so much time in Italy and it's different because like the most of the European union does not allow the same chemicals and modifications to their food that we do. Yeah. Even the things that are added to products, they don't allow it. So when I was in Italy, I was like, oh my God, I could eat pasta and bread all day, every day. And I never gained anything and I never felt bloated or bad, but over here, my God, I, I can't do it. Yeah. I have a friend that orders her flour and her pasta from Italy because it doesn't have, I think it's called the glyphos 
fates or something like oh yeah them. there's oh well, again yeah, carinine and like, there's a, there's so many different things and then it's also we add not sugar we add high fructose corn syrup and salt to it which makes it more addictive yeah it's ridiculous so yeah and sugar is sugar is one of the big proponents of like i don't know if you've ever read the book called sugar blues and like refined sugar is just incredibly bad so i've started using like stevia monk fruit I mean, there are so many different things that we can use to like sweeten. It's like, but after a while, you don't even need them anymore. And you yeah. don't, your body is actually not meant to crave most things. Usually when we crave something, like here's a good example. A lot of people don't know this. In trauma, in a trauma response, you actually end up craving more sugars, which is why people go towards the comfort foods is because not only does it temporarily boost serotonin in your brain, but it's like, because of like the, the amount of energy that is released when those bonds are broken, creates more energy. It's like, it spikes our blood sugar, which again is really meant to be able to run or fight, but that's not happening. So, and another reason why it gets simply stored. So like when we're eating the cake, the cookies, the ice cream, the bread, the pizza, it's like, yeah, and the mac and cheese. It's like, yeah, it, it tastes good mm. for a split second, but it's actually perpetuating a trauma response, makes your body feel fat. You end up feeling more shame. And then you're just actually worse off than when you started. And then you still have not dealt with the emotions that you really needed to. A shit show circle. <laughs> I know, you know what I always tell people, I'm like, you know what, just, just the only way out is through. So just like sit with it. And it's one of the hardest things you'll ever do. Meditation has changed my life. Yeah, and I meditation. never believed it until I experienced it until I actually had that. I mean, like Dr. Joe Dispenza, cause I know you love him too. I love him. Yeah. We like, like it's, he's so absolutely correct. Like becoming supernatural, becoming like your own like the body has such an incredible innate ability to heal itself. And we're actually, it's, it's like, it has its own intellect. And it's like, most of the time we are just so separated from being able to have the ability to listen to it or to facilitate its own healing, which is really what, what Reiki is. So, so when we do that and the mind is actually much more powerful than the body. So it's like the mind at that point can begin to program the body. Yeah. He talks so, about it. It's called coherence. When you yes. sit down and shut up for a minute, your heart and your mind come into the same coherence. And, and that's when sink. you're able to change your future, to heal your body. But most of the time we're like this blah, 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 distracted and we're not even in, we're not even yeah. docked into our body to even be able to start healing like that trauma. Exactly. Yeah. And we don't need, we don't even want to heal. We just want to, we just want what we want. Everybody wants to be comfortable. Everybody wants to strive for homeostasis and yeah, life doesn't work like that. So I'm like, Brandeline, embrace the sock. <laughs> yeah. No, i tell you what I, I do. I, I do. And then I, I think I'm healed. Right. And then something happens. And I cry, and cry. Like yesterday, I got a message from one of his friends that I met at his service. Mm -hmm. never met him before then. And he's like, I have something I want to send you. Oh, I just forget it. I was a mess. I, and he said, it, he found a, a rock outside the funeral home and he told himself, well, I'm going to keep this in remembrance of my friend, Phil. Mm -hmm. He's like, but the longer I kept this rock, he's like, I, it's supposed to be for you. It's almost a heart shape. And so mm -hmm. he polished it and he sent it to me. I just was crying forever about it yesterday. <laughs> Well, and it's also really nice when someone thinks of us too. It, it is. I don't know why I get that. I have to cry if somebody cares. It's weird. Yeah. You already know that you and I worked on that. You already know the answer to that question. Do I? Can you remind yes. me for the listeners? <laughs> it's a worthiness conversation. Oh, uh, Yeah. Yeah, we're wait, the, you mean, wait, uh, you mean that I can actually, uh, like someone sees me, someone actually thinks of me, someone loves me enough to give me something. Yeah. It's worthiness. Yeah. And then cry, cry. Yeah. Get flowers. Yeah. Forget it. Nobody yeah. sent me anything. <laughs> no, you know, your, your next, your next level of cut is actually that you get to let people love you. Yeah. You're still not trusting that they can love you simply for you. 
you're still yeah. in the, you're still in the belief that you have to earn it. Yeah. Fuck and you know, <laughs> and I'm glad that you brought that up because honestly, I had to force myself to step away from my business and I had to just sit there and, and, and after a little bit, I was like, oh, this is cool. I don't have to do anything. Right. But, uh, because I forced myself to not do anything, I got to see uh, the universe was still support me. I still have food and I still have shelter and I don't have to hustle or do anything like you. One of the things that you've said to me before is you're a human being, not a human doing. Mm -hmm. I love that. But for some reason, how many of us are shoving down the being or doing Mm -hmm. do, do, do like you put, you have this limiting belief in your head that you can't have, or once again, that's the distraction. Yeah. Because if I do, 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 and then I, I do for others, then it's like, well, then, then I can, then I can somehow convince myself that I'm worthy of letting them love me. No, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. I was really stuck in that. So that's why I am, I'm coming back really, really slow because I don't want to take one step and that's a false step because it's based on trauma and then build on top of that. I don't want that. Well, and what I would say to you is, it's not a going back. Remember, it's a moving forward. Yeah. Like things, things, you will never be the, the same way that you were. Things can never go back to the way that they were. It's, it's a shattering. And yeah. it's only in the shattering can we have a rising. Yeah. So, and it's, it's, it's a reinvention. Like sometimes things get raised to the ground, you know, by no fault of our own. And that's when we get to rise. And it's sometimes it's, it's challenging. It's like, I would always tell you, take, take whatever time you need. Yeah. It's interesting though, because then your human mind is like, well, well, how much time is that? Your ego, your ego's like, time's up. (laughs) Ego's like, time's up. This was me a few days ago. Time's up. You need to create a new bio. And a couple hours later, I was like, what the fuck is that? Like a trauma. I don't have to do anything. Right. Who said I have to have a bio? Right. Like, no, you don't have to do anything. Right. Who said that? Who told you that? That's a question I love to ask myself. Who said that? Oh, see, and that's what I always told you. I'm like, so where is that coming from? Who told you that? <laughs> yeah. Like, what, what did you make up, Ridley? <laughs> I love it. Oh, my God. I love you. So. <laughs> Tell all these wonderful people where they could find you. Like what's going on? Oh man. Yeah. I'm like, oh, the, the, the best places to find me are going to be Instagram. Like, so it's just Liz child's period coaching. And then I'm on clubhouse. I'm, I've almost got like 3,200 followers, um, going into rooms all the time, especially talking about trauma and yeah. And then I'm also on LinkedIn. You could find me there. So yeah, that's actually, that's my passion is I empower women to conquer trauma, to have emotional freedom. What about that bio? That's sexy. (laughs) You worry? I'm like, I love it. And it's like, you know, as soon as I started to go, wait a minute, it's like, I'm not doing the whole body positivity and, you know, weight loss. It's like, no, it's, it's much deeper than that. And that's my true calling because I didn't get up to 450 pounds by like, you know, by the psychology of it, it was because it was unresolved grief from the death of my father. And I didn't, I was never taught how to deal with those emotions or how to deal with anything. So there was no emotional regulation. I wasn't taught how to sit with anything. And then I wasn't taught how to be in connection and relationship to others. And so, and that's very raw, it's very real. And then most of the time we're just leading quiet lives of desperation. I was no different until I went, no, this is not who I wanna be. This is not where I wanna be. So what gets to change for me to have what I want? Well, you did a great job. You're doing a great job. <laughs> well, I'm, I do my best. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I, 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 I love my never, work. Was never trauma informed, really. I mean, I knew something was going on and I knew it was messing with my business, you know, with my mom and stuff. 
and, and I was still having thoughts and like the authoritative voice. Remember we had to, we had to mm. make that be quiet, <laughs> but it was I, after I worked with you, like, like I was saying in the beginning, gee, thanks. <laughs> it completely, it, it, it completely changed everything. Like, and I love that you said there's no going back. Cause you're right. I'm this whole other person now, you know, and I get to, like you say, I get to come and approach my business and however I want it. And I, and it gets, and I get to be loved without having to do anything. Yeah. And it's like, you know, your, your messaging and even your structure of how you are dealing with things in your business, it's, it's malleable. It can shift and change as it needs to, like, because you're a constantly evolving human being. Yeah, every entrepreneur needs to know that. I mean, because I think a lot of a lot of us, especially people, maybe people my age, right, forty nine, if they're an entrepreneur, unless their parents were entrepreneurs, most of us, there was no rule book, right? So we think, oh, here's my business, and it has to be just like this the whole time, or it has to, you know, go and and grow like those other people you're looking at. No, 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 oh no, you could stop. And you could start and you could change it. You're allowed to do all of those things. Exactly. Give yourself permission. Yep. You always have permission. It's so, you know, and like a lot of times things will happen even without your permission. So you might as well allow it. You know, you just get to shift and change. And that's what I tell people. I am your source for when shift happens. <laughs> <laughs> if shift is happening, call Liz. Yeah. Yep. That's I what it. I do. I'm, I get to be just as like consistent and constant as, as change itself. So it's like, so that's, and I, I just love that. And I love being a stand for, for women to be able to recognize and stand in their own power. Yeah. And that's, that's the basis of it is the trauma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You because know? trauma is really a jagged gift. We don't like <laughs> thinking of it that way, but it's, it's like, it's not the it's not the pain that's in the gift. It's, well, it's not the pain. It's not the gift is beyond the pain. It's really what the gift is within the pain itself. It's like, what does it have to teach you? Not only about yourself, but who you're becoming, you know, what has occurred for you? Like, what do you have to learn about this life and, and the next one? And it's like, for so many people, it's really important to note that if trauma is hereditary, so is healing. And so your ancestors didn't just pass on wounds. They also passed on ancestral strengths. When we become a chain breaker to those things and we're, we're deciding definitively to change something, it can be a very lonely place, which is why I tell people, no one is ever meant to do this work alone. Find someone who believes in you until you do. And that will actually support you in that growth and healing because it can be a very scary, raw process, but you are so worthy. Amen to that. So thank you so much again for coming on here. I know it's going to be one of our popular episodes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and happy new year and yay. Thank you. Sure.